Hey everyone! You might be wondering where Julian is, so allow me to introduce myself. I'm Daniel and I've recently joined the Flow Studio team making artwork and UI for Lens Island. After getting to know the team, I learned about the struggles they faced, and how two beginner game developers from Brisbane put together a game that could sit side by side with titles made by bigger teams with more resources. As we draw closer to its release a week from now, I asked Julian if I could make this documentary and tell you a little bit about the journey behind its development and what it was like navigating the highs and lows throughout it. As I spoke to him, I realized that this is ultimately the story about a relentless pursuit of a dream and how he risked his life to chase the vision of creating Lens Island. Uh, um, we will be releasing actual tutorial videos on how to build both of these um, step by step from block one to finished. Um, later on, this is just like a, sh a small showcase. Who is Julian Ball? That's a great question. I don't know, I never would have seen myself um, being in the position I am, because like who I was as a kid was nothing like I, how I am now. I was always creative, always interested in art, but I was just like a little mongrel as a kid. I just like skateboarded and didn't have any big motivations in life and I just sort of did whatever I felt like. But I was always creative and I always sort of had like this entrepreneurial spirit. So throughout school, I guess I got into graphic design and all that. Um, I studied a course in graphic design. I then started um, university for game design. Throughout the whole time, I was basically building up a business in, um, as a graphic design freelancer and making game art and all sorts of stuff. And then I was also building a YouTube channel too at the same time. Hey guys, it's Julian or Flow Graphics here. And this is my pack. So just before I start off, I would like to say, can you please give it a like? You know, just started off me with my little you know, 14 year old voice telling people how to make, you know, text in, in Photoshop and how to make like a cool looking font or effect. I remember the first time I hit, you know, a thousand subscribers probably about five years ago. And yeah, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And then when I hit 10,000 subscribers, you know, maybe three or four years ago, I thought that was it. Like I didn't think it was getting any higher than that. I thought I sort of accomplished everything that I could. And then, you know, here I am now, um, many years later, the whole channel is now about Flow Studio. It's about a game that we're building. It's about game development. And we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of sort of fans and followers. And it's pretty surreal. It's pretty crazy. I sort of have to pinch myself a lot of the time to remember how far it's come. I, I made a whole bunch of prototypes and projects throughout university. I even made this little, like the first game I ever made was this little 2D side-scroller game called Story of Len, and that's actually where the character Len originated from. Um, and it's got like the same red shirt, and it sort of looks like Len just in his PJs running through a forest. So I continue to make more prototypes, and then the final project for my sort of thesis project was making a game, um, which was ended up being a co-op puzzle platformer game called Tension. And that was my first real sort of experience making a game from start to finish. Look, I love that game. It was so fun to work on and it really taught me all the fundamentals with game design. And Martin was the one who actually marked um, that game and gave me my final score at the end of my university degree. And yeah, I always kept in touch with Martin. I, he was always sort of like the cool lecturer that I got on with. Julian and his entire cohort um, at the time were actually really good students. He came to me with this first person prototype of like um, this building game where you could like, you know, put the foundations in the walls and stuff. Um, and that was the first time he, uh, he came at me with like this like precursor idea for what Lens Island was. It was later after he finished Tension, I think that he started taking those characters out and putting them in there um, and using some of those assets to sort of like change how it was but I remember it initially being a first person um, game that he brought to me one time because he just wanted help with the building system. There was only like one assignment that I failed him for uh, which is like a rapid prototyping assignment. He did just handed me like this dog shit game and I was like ah oh, dude that's like a 30 like no way. Um, uh, that was the only time I failed him because he got complacent and lazy um, but as a student he was really good. Um, when, when it came to group projects he really you know, like kind of took the lead a lot of the time like that. So a little bit of a natural born leader, but that's that's what it was like, you know, teaching him. You know, you didn't really have to help him much. Just explain something once and off he went and he was pretty good at picking things up. So yeah, not many students like him. Once Julian was finished with university, he went on to find employment as a graphic designer for various companies, but all the while continuing working on Lens Island in his spare time. As the years went on, it became harder to balance both his professional life 
and his true passion of working on games, all until he decided to take a leap of faith and follow his dream. I was working at a, a company called Bear Trap and we're making all sorts of like fitness and physio products. You know, I was traveling all around Australia um, and then going to China and I, I was sort of, you know, not home almost every week for like a year. Like I was traveling constantly, going to conventions and shows and all sorts of stuff. And um, I was living a very busy life. It was very rewarding and everything was great. You know, I had a good job, fantastic boss and good pay and everything was just so perfect. Uh, but it just really didn't settle me creatively. And I started to get just pretty depressed and pretty sad over time. And I just felt like I just owed it to myself to, to do what I thought I was best at in life. And that's always been game design. It's always been, yeah, like sort of making games and making YouTube videos and sharing it with the community. It really came to this turning point one day where I just said, that's it. Like I'm going to figure out a way to make this happen. I don't care what it takes. I'll figure out a plan. So my plan was to basically save up, save up my money um, and and quit my job and then launch Flow Studio, hopefully launch a Kickstarter and have enough money left over to sort of pay the bills, pay my rent for the next year or two while I, you know, build Lens Island. Pretty much as soon as COVID started was when I left the job. Um, so it's almost two years now that I've basically been funding my own lifestyle, building the game studio, you know, jobless, working from home in this in this room all day, um, making Lens Island. And I think it was probably around late 2018, sort of starting to become 2019, when I finally called up Martin, you know, got sushi with him and basically pitched him the idea of Lens Island. And uh, he actually had a job offer at the time too. So he basically had to either pick between this lucrative job offer making casino games that paid tons of money um, or start on Lens Island. And I think some stuff ended up happening anyway and sort of made his decision a bit easier, but he ended up picking Lens Island. And then we basically both sort of dropped everything, put our lives on hold. He cut down all of his hours. I had fully quit my job and then we, we started making Lens Island. It was February of 2018 when Julian began to work on Lens Island, with Martin joining the project the following year in October of 2019. Once Julian had quit his job, full-time development had begun in February of 2020, a full two years after he had started. Although the DNA of Lens Island can be traced back from previous projects Julian worked on over the years, one of the main inspirations behind it was combining the greatest hits of all of his favourite gameplay elements. I guess one half of Lens Island is me combining all of my favorite games, you know, Team Fortress 2, um, League of Legends, Minecraft, Sims, Diablo, all those, and they're like all random games that have nothing in common for the most part, but they all have elements that I really, really like. I guess because the people that play Diablo don't usually get to build a house and manage a farm, and the people that play Sims don't usually get to manage a big inventory of items and explore and, you know, find cool weapons to use and get better at using them. So I guess Lens Island was my attempt um, at sort of making those features cross over in a meaningful way, but then sort of wrapping it in this package that is really like aesthetically pleasing and looks pretty. So I can try and get as many people as possible to experience these cool little nuggets of gameplay that are completely different and like sort of opposite sides of the spectrum. As Julian continued to document his progress developing Lens Island on YouTube, there was still a core component that was untouched from the game, sound design. That's where Lars Erik Fjusne Eide comes in, a sound designer from Norway who had worked on projects including Team Fortress 2. He stumbled upon Julian's channel and was impressed with what he saw, so he decided to reach out by email and ask if the project needed any sound design, and it just so happened that they did. So, uh, yeah, so I basically just... Um basically just sent in an email just asking straight up hey do you do you want to do you need something like do you need any sound designs do you need any music for your game um i would be happy to to help out uh and then he responded uh quite surprisingly pretty pretty fast i think he was like the next day he, he responded then we just talked a little bit back and forth i showed him some stuff i'd done in the past and and um we we just or he decided hey, that he wanted to to uh, let me 
try, try on some stuff for him. So I think he was uh, the director of a movie called Monster. I think he was like an indie director. It's a long time ago. But I remember he said like, great visuals can't save bad audio, but good audio can save bad visuals. Uh, and that's not and that's not saying that Lens Island is bad visuals because it's uh, to me it's the opposite. Uh, so I had to kind of like compliment in in, the, in in this sense. I had to compliment the, the, the you know the beautiful game that they have developed. Uh, to me, I think it's it's like really really visually pleasing to to both look at and play. There's a lot riding on this game. Everything is riding on this game, and not just for me anymore. You know, Martin's a part of it. And then now we have help from other people as well. You know, there's Ivan and there's Lars and there's Daniel. And, you know, there's a lot of people contributing to this. Um, it started with me, you know, but it's not me anymore. For example, Julian, he's uh, like, he has a vision, right? And um, he decides to, for example, uh, there needs to be this screenshot mode, right, in the game. And this is something like, um, you will not see in other games like all these features and things he implements and he uh, envisions and, and, and decides to build in even though he doesn't have to um, but he understands like uh, what it needs to make uh, Lens Island special and it's been great to kind of watch that process you know and and see him come up with all these ideas and implement them as well and that's what's making the game special all right all these visions he has about it being implemented just by the two of them and it's like what a it's not a team of five right like it's basically julian and martin working a lot and i'm here you know just kind of helping out i'm the intern i'm the intern you know <laughs> if i if i were in australia i would be making coffee for those guys and trying to help them out as much as i could <laughs> Now live. Remember this moment, Martin? Forever. <laughs> Big moment. <laughs> On July 25th, 2020, five months after Julian had quit his job to pursue Lens Island full time, the official Kickstarter was launched and would go on to break their initial goal of $30,000 in just a few days. By the end, they would have almost double that amount, which would go into funding their lives and allow them to keep working on it. However, despite the success of the Kickstarter, there was now a very real and looming pressure in Julian to deliver the game people were expecting. I remember launching the Kickstarter and seeing all this support and money and all these amazing comments just flow in and I felt amazing for like 10 minutes. And then in the same day that, you know, I think we broke our our goal of $30,000 in like a couple of days. And the moment we broke that, you know, I should have been really happy, but honestly, I just felt terrible. And it was, I think it was just the feeling really setting in that, wow, like this is real. Like there is a monumental amount of stress and pressure on me personally now to make all these people happy, to provide them with the game that they're asking for. And there's no other option. Like I have to make this game, it has to be good. Otherwise my career is just sort of ruined. Like I've got no avenues forward. I've sort of put all of my bets on this to work. I think everyone can empathize when you talk about being stressed or having anxiety because everyone feels it to some degree. There is a, a big spectrum and it really shifts and changes throughout your life. It's, it's gotten, you know, worse over time. You know, the, the closer you get to launch day, the more stress there is, the shorter time frames become the more that I guess the reality sets in. Like the second I quit my job, um, I tried the whole nine to five thing and then very soon realized that was not gonna cut it. You know, we're two people trying to make an enormous game that absolutely shouldn't be tackled by two people, but we wanted to do it anyway. Like I think it's, that was part of the draw of Lens Island for, for me especially, and I think Martin too. The typical days is really like 12 to 14 hours of hard intensive working. And it's been like that for a very long time, like the past few years. And it's slowly gotten, you know, worse. Like <laughs> we slowly have less and less time. Um, the first couple of years we, you know, we would do things on the weekends and would have a bit more of a social life and stuff. But especially in the past six months, you know, we just unfortunately don't have that luxury, but it's something that we, we know, like we acknowledged and we sort of completely knew this lifestyle and what it would be like going into it. We signed up for it. 
it was a lot easier at the start, right? But then maybe for about like the last year, you know, day in, day out, that's what I've been doing, right? Just up to Julian's, then back home. Um, and even though I like, you know, I know that two years have passed, I don't have like a lot of new memories within that time. So it's like, it, it feels like almost no time has passed um, just because it's like every day is the same thing. One thing that's made development so much easier has been I don't know how respectful and just awesome the community's been throughout the whole way. Yeah, we, we've had our struggles, we've had our setbacks with dates, we've had to push demos, we've had to push launch dates. As you get with game development, especially when you know two people trying to make such a big game, um, naturally things get out of hand sometimes. But the community has always just been really supportive and just right there behind us. Um, I, I, would, I would hate to think what it would be like if, you know, not only having the pressure of all of this, but then having the pressure of people sort of like the angry mob of pitchforks. We've been lucky enough to not get that. Um, and look, we have, I think there's something that's really helped that is being so transparent of development. You know, Lens Island has been shaped quite literally by the people watching the dev diaries. You know, you could sift through the comment section and say when someone suggested to add an item or suggested to add this mechanic and like that's that's like in the game now you know it's a, it's a real thing we show you know the entirety of making lens island i've uploaded you know dev diary videos you know interacting with the audience and asking questions and getting feedback so they've seen every step of the way i'm making this game for everybody i'm making this for all, all the players that are going to play the game i'm not making it for me to play you know so listening to the community and, and sort of making it alongside of them has what's enabled Lens Island to become what it is. And um, because of that, they've supported us. Because we give them a respect, they give us a respect back. And if we need to delay it, you know, usually we get messages of, of love and care and telling people, for, you know, us, people telling us to take a break and to, you know, go get some sleep, sleep and all of that. And it's really, really nice to hear that. I think also for me, Julian is a perfectionist uh, regarding his project. Um, he and I understand that he wants it to be the best it can be. But uh, yeah, I try to convince him that it's good enough. You know, like it's it's he should be, you know, happy with what he's releasing. So, uh, um, but I understand also that he he wants it to be perfect. I think at least for Martin and, and Julian, they, they work their asses off every day. Like, they, I don't think they do anything other than sleeping, eating and, you know, working on this game. Uh, me personally, I, I'm working full time as well as, you know, Ivan and uh, we kind of try to chip in and help out when, when we have, uh, you know, free time to, to help out. So this is where Lens Arms made. Here's my little Lego house. It's very cute. Um, Pretty like, yeah, this wide monitor is great for working on the game. And I've got my little um, Thocky keyboard. I think my parents are probably my biggest supporters and my biggest fans. And that's something that's really been pivotal in my life. I couldn't imagine doing it without having my family in the background and then also having like my, my girlfriend Steph there, my partner there beside me the whole time. There's no way, like there's absolutely no way that I would be making Lens Island still um, if I didn't have Steph or my family. 10 months following their Kickstarter launch, the next big item on the agenda was showcasing Lens Island on the Steam Next Festival of 2021, which would be the first time the game was open to the public to play. As is common with most game development, the scope of the game began to grow throughout time, now, I'm not going to walk you through the nitty gritty details as most of that has already been covered on the channel, but as the Steam Next Fest grew closer, the stakes continued to rise and the piles of tasks were seemingly endless. For Julian, the stress had already begun to affect his physical health until one day, it all came crashing down. At, before making Lens Island, I, I sort of just thought that, you know, stress and anxiety was something that's just in the mind and it doesn't really affect anything outside of that. And, you know, it wasn't until you know, it, it wasn't until I was, you know, in an ambulance when it really hit me that, you know, I need to take care of myself and this is some serious stuff. It was in the months leading up to the Steam Next Fest, you know, when we are under a pretty crazy crunch, you know, there's, yeah, we had to get the demo ready and it had to be perfect, you know, because it was going to be showcased to the world. And um, I was really, really feeling the stress and I was just noticing, I was just sort of getting worse and worse every day. 
And I thought, oh no, look, I'm just gonna have a movie night one night with my friends and try and not work and just sort of switch off. And yeah, and I just couldn't, I couldn't switch off the whole night. I just felt anxious and stressed and just like this, you know, thing was building inside of me. And um, halfway through the movie, I went upstairs, I was sort of looking in the mirror and I was like, man, I feel terrible. I just seemingly was fine sitting down watching a movie and then 10 minutes later I was sort of like really panicking, you know, thinking something's really wrong and I don't know what it is. So, you know, I get I get Steph to call the ambulance um, and yeah, it just, it just went downhill. I, I just didn't believe that my heart was going as quick as it was. It was, you know, sitting there and my whole body was shaking and I couldn't see properly. I could barely breathe, like I couldn't feel my lips, I couldn't feel my arms. I wasn't sure what was going on, like if I was having a heart attack or what. And um, it got to the point where I was starting to pass out and I was sort of barely coherent, you know, I couldn't really stay awake. And it really felt like I was, <laughs> I really felt like I was sort of struggling to, to stay alive. When, when I heard that, um, like, you know, because they didn't tell me right away, I was, I was like, you know, texting um, uh, Julian the, the morning after that had happened, and then um, I wasn't getting answers, so that then I reached out to his, uh, his girlfriend, and I was like, yo, Steph, what's up? And, um, um, you know, I, I then got the answer back. Um, and so, like, that had me really, really worried. Like, you know, I felt like a, like a sinking in my heart. Like, oh, man, like, if, if something, you know, were uh, to happen to him, like, I don't know what I would do. In March of this year, Julian was admitted to the hospital with a severe case of supraventricular tachycardia, or SVT. Julian's heart was fluctuating past 200 BPM, and then quickly dropping over the course of three hours. I was sort of barely conscious and just sort of coming in and out. I just remember sort of looking up, just looking at my heart rate on this monitor, and I was just sort of seeing it sort of go, you know, duh, 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 and like just literally like in the movies, like I was just seeing my heart stop and then just starting to sort of fade away and then that would sort of shock me and then I would just, it, like it just felt like, man, I just was born again. Like it just felt like I just got this lightning through my body and I was like screaming every single time they would shock me. Like it would just go, ah, and I'd like to stand up and and like come out of my, you know, sit up and they'd have to push me back down. They'd go, calm down, John, calm down. And then like my heart rate would shoot back up to 200. And it was literally like I was just going in between death and then, you know, too much life. <laughs> I just remember in the middle of the night, my dad coming to the hospital, you know, with his, you know, and I was just there and I just felt like a vegetable, like I could barely talk or do anything. I was like pale, trying to have to explain to my dad, you know, how I was just watching a movie and the next, next thing, you know, next thing I know. You know, yeah, I'm in an ambulance. And yeah, look, that was, yeah, it just, that really sort of opened my eyes to how serious stuff can get, you know. Here I was just thinking I was a little bit stressed, you know, making a game and just meditate every so often or go for a run and that'll make it all better. But yeah, like, you know, shit can get real pretty quickly. I end up getting better. I, you know, sort of slowly came to and I spent a day or two in hospital and they let me out. And literally I've had like five different doctors tell me that I'm just killing my heart with the amount of stress and anxiety levels that I've sort of induced over the past couple of years. It's, it's weird like that, you know, I'm sort of pursuing my dream and trying to, you know, add meaning to my life and trying to do the one thing that really makes me happy and at the same time it was literally killing me like it's getting better you know I'm, I'm have to be on heart medication for the rest of my life now and I can't drink coffee you know like I I can't you know even really drink alcohol properly like I can't have a Red Bull I can't really do much at all because I'm just scared that I'm gonna you know have a heart attack now you definitely don't have to like get a heart attack to make a game it's something that you can hopefully 
avoid. Um, maybe learn from my experiences and, you know, <laughs> adjust your life to not be so stressed. But I don't want to do anything else, you know? For me, it's just like, I've given up a lot. I've sacrificed a lot to make this happen and it's all been worth it. I, I sort of consider them all life lessons in making me a, a better and smarter and, and stronger person, you know? In the weeks following Julian's arrhythmia, things started to get better. And as the Steam Next Festival grew closer, there was some more hope. The game that they had spent so much time working on was starting to get big attention and became a huge relief for the rest of the team. Their hard work was leading them into somewhere special. We got asked by Steam to join the Next Fest and I thought that was a great opportunity to showcase the demo and I remember going into it thinking, well, if we, if we get over 10,000 people playing the demo, that would be amazing. Like, I'd be really, really stoked with that. And, um, yeah, I remember the first day that we launched this Next Fest, I started seeing the numbers rolling in and they're sort of coming through slowly. I wasn't sure sort of like if it was correct or what was going on. I actually went out for dinner with my friend and we'll, we'll have it a beer. And I was sort of me just like, you know, unwinding after just this crazy crunch of like a month or two of Martin and I getting this demo ready and just sort of scrambling. And this was like my one little break that I got. And I pulled up my phone and just remember looking at the Steam stats and then just saw that we got it was something, it was like 20,000 wish lists and like 50,000 people downloaded the demo in the first day. And I remember just seeing it and I was just, yeah, it was just crazy. Like it was just, um, like I just felt like crying. <laughs> you know, it was just this sense of relief where I just thought like, wow, like I, yeah, it just totally just blew my expectations out of the water. You know, for the longest time, I've just been working on this without, you know, really seeing you know, other people like it and get engaged um, with it. So just like, you know, absolutely, you know, demolishing our October, you know, November goal was was just like amazing. And then we broke into like, you know, um, Steam top 100 wish list, which is like where all the big boys are. Um, I, I also have a screenshot of when we're at 69 because that's the best number, right? You know, if you're not number one on the, on, on the Steam wish list, you have to be 69. I think it exploded a little bit on the Steam Next Festival. I don't think we expected it to to do that well. Because I mean, there's there's so many games being published every single day. It's it's really really hard to 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 get through that you know that ocean of games. I was expecting like um, maybe you know uh, we would be top one thousand or something. Um, and then uh, Julian came back saying like uh, eventually, hey, we are on the top 100 and uh, we pretty we got even higher than that. I was like, oh my God, what am I doing here? This is <laughs> this is going to be crazy. Like the amount, <laughs> like I, I was, I, I thought like I would just, you know, go and hide myself and, and pretend I, I've never been there. It's fantastic. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. And having mainly two guys achieving that is just, that's magical, <laughs> if you ask me. When the Steam Fest ended, I remember thinking back to that, that 30,000 number. And we're just shy of 200,000 downloads at the end of the, the Next Fest. Um, we were top five. Uh, for most of the Next Fest, we were top five most downloaded and trending demos. So, yeah, look, that was, that was sort of what really added some fuel and really kept us going. I, it, you know, times would be pretty tough, I imagine, if we didn't have all of that because this, that sense of like verification, like, man, we've been working so hard tirelessly for years to make this happen. And we released this tiny demo that just shows such a tiny slice of gameplay and people loved it. And, you know, it was just so special. I, I remember I was just up like all night that week, you know, just every single night watching Twitch streams, watching content creators making Let's Plays. And I was just like, you know, on my computer analyzing them playing the game and I was like pausing it back. Oh, why did they do that? Oh, there's a bug, there's a bug. And I have like this gigantic bugs list on my notepad on one screen. The other screen had all these streams and YouTube videos open, just analyzing people playing the game. It's also opened up the door for every single game publisher and investment fund emailing me nonstop, wanting a slice of the pie. Um, and it feels pretty good to say no to all of them too. That, that, <laughs> that was pretty funny too, you know publishers and designers that I've always looked up to and then just being like nah it's all good like we can do this without you um, because I don't I don't want to sacrifice anything I don't want to 
put Lens Island at risk. And if anyone's gonna be telling me how to make Lens Island, where to spend my money, who to hire, that's a, that's a massive problem. Like that's seriously going to jeopardize the game that we wanna make. And here I am meanwhile, like turning down all this money while I have to like sell my car to just like keep the lights on and you know, empty out my savings account to pay people and keep Flow Studio alive, you know, because the Kickstarter money was great, and but it, it runs out, you know, really quickly paying bills. There's a lot of expenses people don't think about when setting up a game studio. It's sort of a double-edged sword. It's sort of funny from the outside. Everyone sees how successful that everything's been so far. And, you know, we get all this affirmation and these publishers come in at us. And then from the inside, we're just, you know, a couple of developers running off a savings account that's dwindling down with, you know, just eating a lot of noodles and drinking a lot of Red Bull, working in a bedroom, just like patching together this game, just stressing out, trying to make it all happen. Like I said to Julian, like, in my opinion, the state of the game as it is right now is really good. So I'm confident. Uh, and it's an early access release, right? So uh, there will still be a lot of work put into it. Um, but it's on a good track. I'm, I'm happy about it. I'm confident it's going to be a successful release. Uh, but it's it's definitely really really fun to me to be part of uh, I guess this journey um, and and working with you know everyone that's so passionate about passionate about this project uh, that gives me a lot of energy and it's it's really really fun. Um, I hope people uh, sort of like stand back and hopefully through Lens Island sort of like get the idea that like you know you know like work and stuff is fine but you know you really want to go and like live and have fun. Uh, which is ironic considering all the crunch stuff we were just talking about, but that, that's what I'd really like. Otherwise they give me money and that's fine. I'm happy with that. It's fine. <laughs> Lens Island at the start of early access is just what Martin and I can manage to pull off by ourselves. But you know, we want to take it far. We want to expand the studio to a dozen people. You know, I want to make all the stuff that's wrong <laughs> with me working in this bedroom, stressing, pulling my hair out every day, emptying my savings account. I want to get all those problems and remove them and make them into a flourishing company where we make beautiful games that people really enjoy. And it's going to take a couple of years and it's going to take a lot of people and a lot of amazing skills and the community support to get it there. But, you know, if we keep getting the love um, that we've gotten so far from the community, like I, I think we can make it. I think we can do it. At the time of recording this voiceover, Lens Island is just a week away from launch. The stories of its struggles and development have been extremely surprising to me, and there is no doubting the passion behind the team at Flow Studio. If you want to keep up to date with the story and the development, we release regular dev diaries right here on the channel. We're all extremely excited to launch the game, and we can't wait to see what the future holds for us. We'll see you there.